So I've had an amazing less than a week here in Australia so far. I've been in Sydney for a few days, Melbourne for a few days. Um, our, I focus on juvenile justice reform, and so I've had the amazing opportunity to visit juvenile justice facilities, uh, both the uh, Reby Center here uh, in the Sydney area and the Parkway <coughs> Center in Melbourne. So I've gotten to really uh, meet kids who are incarcerated here in Australia and learn directly from them about uh, what their experiences have been like and how similar and different they may be from uh, the United States. Um, so I am the executive director and board president of the Board of Trustees of my family foundation, the Tao Foundation, and uh, we've really been uh, privileged to participate in some collaborative efforts around uh, juvenile justice reform in the state of Connecticut, which is where we're based and now in New York in a much more formal collective impact. It was before collective impact was something that people were really talking about, um, which you know, is pretty recent that we're using that actually the, those words to define what we do. Um, but we, we got on that road uh, quite a while ago. Uh, so at the Tao Foundation, our guide, we're a family foundation. It was established by my parents in 1988. Uh, who quickly invited their children to come on the board, just to give you a little context. So I'm the second generation of uh, the foundation. The wealth was accumulated within my early childhood and teen years. My parents came from extremely humble beginnings. They were a true American dream story. Uh, they wanted to help other people have the same chances that they had had in life to uh, become successful. And really, our, everything we do is grounded on the fact that we feel it's our obligation to use the form of the foundation to alleviate pain and suffering, oppor offer opportunities for joy, and help others achieve its success. Uh, and in order to do that, we've had to ask ourselves a lot of questions about who needs us the most, and uh, what are the organizations that are in our community that are, are really doing the best work and going in and talking to them about what really excites them, what they would never ask us for money for, but that they really want to do, and not come into the relationship with the, you know, talking about the power uh, struggle. Foundations hold the, the pocketbooks, right? So everybody wants to tell us what we want to hear and do what we, they think we want to do. So we kind of turn the tables on that and say, we're not the experts. We don't know what the answers are. We need you to tell us. Uh, and um, we've used that as sort of the foundation and, and founding philosophy of how we start to look at uh, dealing with some of these very, very uh, complex problems. And uh, you know, we looked around at our colleagues, and we realized that um, our, you know, most foundations are funding in individual organizations. And those organizations are working competitively to get our grants. Uh, they're evaluating themselves individually and not across systems. And that the idea of scale, which we talk about a lot in our field now, was really about replication of a small program into another community or a larger population. It wasn't really looking at the broader systems that were affecting uh, um, you know, really large numbers of people. And uh, in general, we weren't working with government or corporate sector, this corporate sector, and um, there was disconnections all over the place. And we were really committed to trying to do more, do better, and we realized that in order to um, have impact on communities and not just individuals, we start, had to start looking differently at our funding model. So, sorry, this is kind of tiny, but. So with that starting point of the question to our grantees, what are you doing, what, you know, what, what do you dream about getting funding for but would never ask us? Um, we had to learn to be really flexible, nimble, have a willingness to learn a new skill and learn a new interest area. Our foundation had no background in juvenile justice. We didn't really understand the population that we don't have. I'm not an attorney. I didn't have any background in that way. So I really had to uh, rely on the experts in the field, those who are running systems and those who are consumers of those systems. Uh, that's been mentioned a lot. So that required a tremendous culture shift within our organization. We were really writing checks to large organizations and really just trusting that they were going to do the best they could with it. 
but um, we talk, I mean, just, it's great that Liz's comments go, you know, go right into that sort of shift in the power dynamic. It wasn't us coming in and saying, we're gonna fix you. It was co us coming in and saying, how can we help you? And really listening, being open to what they had to say and willing to be willing to take risks and do things that were sort of outside the, the normal grant making, oh, we give money to an organization to execute program. But to bring together people to pay for facilitation, to convene groups, to use our neutrality and credibility to bring people together. It also required us to think in the long, you know, on a long term basis. There was no way we were going to solve problems like this in a, you know, we're three years and we're out strategy. We can do it one year at a time, we can do three years at a time, and we had to really be looking over the long term. And we first started investigating around juvenile justice in the late 1990s, and we're still in it, and there's still a lot of work to do. So it's, you know, decades, decades. You see a lot of milestones along the way, but you have to be in it for the long term. Um, so we asked ourselves and the colleagues that we um, started to interact with who were running systems is are you continue, would you, would you continue to be satisfied paying for failure or are you ready to invest in success? Because uh, the potential costs are just too high both to society and individuals and communities to continue to lock people up who have committed minor crimes and not give them any rehabilitative or therapeutic services while they're behind bars. Uh, and the high cost to, to society of keeping the stat, you know, just living with the status quo um, was just not good enough for us. And we were hoping that that would be true. And we used this cost benefit poster to illustrate the cost of incarcerating and treating a young person in the juvenile justice system and a, the cost of a lifetime of crime, which is basically locking people up and paying for them to be housed in institutions for their whole life, almost $4 million a year, as, uh, as opposed to the things that every child needs and deserves, which is quality after school programming, a university education, job training, much less expensive, and the ultimate benefit would be a tax-paying citizen who could potentially contribute a $1 million over their lifetime to society. Uh, in general, the positive influences on young people are both more effective and less expensive. And uh, we use this poster, we made this available around the country in the U.S. and states all over the U.S. have plugged in their own numbers and use this to advocate for whatever types of legislative change they're working on in the moment. So over uh, a decade of funding, we really got in in the late 1990s. Um, and I mean, this is just data up till 2010. Things continue to do better. This, the results we've had by working collaboratively and collectively uh, in Connecticut uh, have been quite remarkable. And it's been an, it's sort of an evolutionary and organic process over a period of time <laughs> where we've invested a lot in our own grant money and staff time, and so have the organizations um, both advocacy organizations, direct service organizations, and our state leadership. Um, and you know, some of the results, we had both policy results where we've had enormous legislative changes that have affected tens of thousands of young people. And we've also had great results as far as young people doing better, not reoffending, completing programs, and um, having a, a continuum of evidence-based practice now available in our communities. Uh, so we said, how can we take the success we've had in Connecticut in this sort of informal, collaborative way and take it to scale? And how can we fast track the results? Um, we're funding national advocacy groups, uh, but our next door state of New York uh, really had many really deeply entrenched problems. And we thought, how can we take what we've learned in Connecticut and take it on the road and address this very complex uh, and massive system in New York? So New York 
uh, really quite unbelievably spends th almost three hundred thousand dollars a year to lock kids up, and they about n they re uh, recidivate at approximately ninety percent. So talk about throwing money away. Uh, the our state was ready to make a change. I mean, no, you know, talk about data informed. Um, you can't turn away from this. You can't be satisfied to pay for failure any longer. Um, our system was broken, it was failing to deliver and rehabilitate youth, it was inefficient and unsafe. And um, so the first thing we did was we said, well, what really is the New York juvenile justice system? And this is the system map that we ended up with. <laughs> uh, and so this was an incredibly, incredibly informative exercise where the, the system is actually comprised of hundreds of public and private agencies that span courts, law enforcement, probation, county services, state agencies across 62 counties in New York State. Um, so the juvenile justice system also, which is in quotes because it's not a standalone system, it has to coordinate with education, mental health, child welfare. I mean, the youth that are in state care are passing through all of these systems and they're not working together, they're not talking to each other. And uh, you know, how can we solve a problem like this? So this is when we start talking about collective impact. This problem seems insurmountable. It was really clear that no single intervention was gonna be the answer. Uh, we couldn't just scale one rehabilitation provider. We couldn't change one law. We couldn't re-engineer one state agency. It just wasn't gonna cut it, right? This is what the definition of a complex social problem. So we saw that as both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, our system was ineffective despite those in astronomical costs. Uh, kids were, uh, were uh, not doing well. They were coming out reoffending and going into the adult system. Over 60% of youth were rearrested within two years of release from state custody. And our facilities were under investigation by the US Department of Justice for brutal conditions of confinement. So talk about the challenge. So on the flip side of that, the opportunity is that there was an urgency for change. People could not live with these numbers anymore. It was shameful. And both of, uh, our governor, Andrew Cuomo, and our New York City mayor at the time, Michael Bloomberg, had publicly made the case for juvenile justice reform. There were promising reform efforts around the state, little pockets of success, but they were not aligned toward common goals. Uh, and there was evidence, brain science evidence, all kinds of wonderful resources, um, data and science to back up the fact that young people had the ability to change, to do better, and become productive members of society. So we grabbed onto that and we brought in those five uh, elements of collective impact. Did you talk about that before I, in this morning? Um, we were fortunate enough to engage in a statewide strategic planning effort uh, with an organization called FSG that has really, uh, you know, written about collective impact formally. And um, we uh, were an early test case. This is 2011 that we started this work, I think, right around the time that the first article was published by FSG. And so we bought into the idea of they brought to us the knowledge that we had to come up with an, a, common, a common agenda build in tools to do shared me measurement, um, you know, uh, do all of the mutually reinforcing activities and continue to talk to each other and learn from each other and support a backbone organization to really make sure that the work stayed on track. So our process, uh, which was facilitated by FSG and funded by a collection of seven or eight private foundations and our state government together, it was an incredibly leveraged um, project and um, on your tables is the case study that we published to talk about uh, exactly how we did it and why we did it and what the uh, exciting <coughs> outcomes have been and um, we um, we were we were really lucky to be one of this this early test case um, and that has really allowed us to, as I said, attempt to replicate Connecticut's uh, success and fast track the work. Uh, so phase one of the work focused on coming up with a common vision across the state and it took six months to get to this 10 word 
vision <laughs> that across New York State, the juvenile justice system promotes youth success and ensures public safety. <coughs> Sounds really simple, right? This is not rocket science. <coughs> safe communities mean successful youth, and successful youth means safe communities. The law enforcement community should not be in direct uh, uh, conflict with the social service sector and, uh, and vice versa. And so we brought all of those voices to the table and our steering committee was made up of stakeholders from all across the system and community. And uh, we had youth and family representation, and they had equal seats at the table to people who were running, you know, judges and people who were running uh, our youth prisons and jails, and uh, and state police uh, chiefs and prosecutors. And uh, for the first time in the state's history, the steering committee came together to establish this common vision and goals for change. And it took us six months because there were a lot of personalities, a lot of contentious issues, a lot of turf. And having FSG to come in and do that high level facilitation, they interviewed everyone in advance of the first meeting. They knew all who hated who, who was going <laughs> to come in and throw their notebook on the table. and. Uh, and try to hijack the meeting, who was going to never speak up publicly and say a word, and they brought, they came into the process really anticipating all of that and uh, embracing it and making sure that everybody was heard. So originally we had everyone's pet thing on, on the table and we came together to come up with this one really succinct vision. Uh, and that's what allowed us to then move on to create a set of guiding principles that our system would be effective, fair, safe, and accountable. And these slides are gonna be, I think, on the website and available to people so you don't have to scramble to write everything down. But as a result of the strategic plan, uh, these principles uh, unified the state's efforts for the first time, uh, and it included the public, community members, families, youth, system prof professionals, and victims. So we really brought all those voices to the table, made sure everybody was heard, they had an equal um, footing, and, um, and then we got to work. Then the hard part started, right? We came up with the vision, we knew what we wanted, but how on earth are we gonna get there? So um, our steering committee established a series of work groups, uh, the primarily on the identifying the existing continuum of services. Remember that crazy system map? We didn't know, the state didn't know what it was funding, where, whether it was effective or not. So the, for the first time, we started to build a database of all the services that were available around the state. Um, and um, the other work group was to look at available data and start to create a system where we could inform our work by using uh, up to the minute data and make policy decisions and uh, uh, based on that. So we also came up with a set of 10 uh, critical near-term action steps and that's on the back of the case study and they were um, arranged around three uh, very important areas. Assuring quality system government, governance, accountability and coordination and we had a series of goals under that implementing an effective continuum of services based on best practices, and we had a series of goals under that area, and collecting and sharing data to make information-driven decisions and policies. And uh, f we, uh, the, the strategic plan steering group m uh, evolved into what we called the strategic planning action committee, not just implementation, but really action-oriented work to try to achieve those goals uh, over the, the next three to five years. And we, our backbone staff is actually funded by our state government. So uh, the, our governor designated staff people within our criminal justice agency to, uh, to support the effort. The benefits of this work, and I, I feel bad because I'm talking through most of my time, but I will take questions. I'm standing between you and lunch, so you can stay as long as you want and ask me questions. <laughs> Um, the benefits for us as a funder and for our system as a whole have been that we have really been able to amplify the impact that we could ever have if we worked individually, and that includes the most uh, dedicated advocate, the deepest pocketed funder, or the system leader 
who you know is running an enormous bureaucracy. We cannot possibly do this work alone. Um, it was really in allowed us to take a, a look uh, at how inefficient the system was, the incredible waste of resources that you could send a young person to one of the finest Ivy League universities in, in uh, Connecticut for just a fraction of what it costs to put them in a cell and lock the door for 12 hours a day uh, at night or longer um, was just, you know, we couldn't live with that anymore. So how could we leverage that funding? How could we, as a foundation, with only being able to put small amounts of money in, leverage government funding, leveraging our funding, other funding partners, and get the most out of the nonprofit organizations that we were supporting? Um, and, uh, you know, the biggest benefit was the alignment, the for coming together around that unified vision, creating a set of performance metrics so that we could track whether we were actually achieving the goals we set out to do, being willing to revisit them constantly. Are we on the right path? Did we, was this a disaster? Did we make a mistake? Do we have to reassess and do things differently? Um, and also to track the young people I mean, because really, God come back, it's all about the kids. I mean, all these systems exist for the betterment of public safety and youth success, right? But I mean, it's incredible how we have created systems and jobs and bureaucracies around trying to do well, do the best we can for kids, and the kids aren't part of the conversation. They're not on, on our minds. So that's what this process really brought us all back to why Every single person I've ever talked to, it doesn't matter how high level they are, they, they got into the work for the right reasons, but they, they get caught up in what they do and they forget. They, they forget why they're there. So this work really brought it back home for everyone. Uh, let's see. So I'll give you a few results between um, in New York in just two short years. So we really engaged in the formal collective impact process in 2011. So actually the case study that have, you have in front of you has uh, data that is re you know, really comes up through 2013. Um, but the, the policy results were that we have now really uh, strong relationships all across systems, uh, people who are not talking to each other. In fact, they were walk working at cross purposes before this work. We have a really deep knowledge of what programs and services are available for young people and whether they're working or not. Uh, we've had some significant policy changes at the state level. One of them is called Close to Home, which is a justice reinvestment uh, uh, project where faci upstate facilities that kids were getting sent, to, you know, seven, eight hour drive from their homes in New York City to go to facilities. Have, those facilities have been closed and the money has been br brought back to the communities that they come from and invested in both secure and non-secure opportunities so they can be close to their families and close to the communities they're going to return to after they're incarcerated. This incredible commitment to d data driven decisions and policy, um, that's been, I mean, really extraordinary. And also the engagement of local communities. Uh, you'll see one of the outcomes in the case study is that we created a network of what we call regional youth justice teams. So we don't just have people working at the high le state level. We have in ten, 10 regions around the state, we have local groups and coalitions that have applied to the state through an RFP process. Uh, and they have, they're required to have police, community services, probation, uh, youth advocates, victims, they all have to be at the table. And they're feeding information back up to the, uh, our st strategic plan action group, which is the backbone. And the backbone is putting local data and information back <coughs> into the community so they really understand who their kids are and what they need. Um, new stakeholders. I mean, the fact that um, we brought the advocates into the room when we did the original visioning meant that for the very first time, youth and families were represented at the highest um, level of strategy. And their voice has been so important, and it's really built a credibility for them that they never experienced before, and they're having tremendous influence on decisions that we're making. Uh, and really just the <coughs> leverage, the um, the, the small amount of investment that went in in the beginning with this group between the state and the private foundations to do this statewide planning has just been, the, the payoff has been absolutely incredible in the results. And uh, those quantifiable results that we're looking at is uh, 
youth are doing better and they're not doing and there's no risk to public safety because youth are being detained at much lower rates they're completing probation they're um, they're uh, not going into our state facilities and at the same time juvenile arrests have dropped by 25 percent I mean the most staggering number is that justice reinvestment number which is the fact that closing these high-end facilities means that almost half the kids that were being locked up are now being served in their local communities and that's what leads to that number of a 45 percent decline of youth in state custody pretty exciting right i mean we have just been you know <laughs> so you know it comes down to who takes credit everybody who's been at the table is able to take credit for this work there is no one person no one entity that can say i did this alone we couldn't have even dreamed of doing it alone and now we've achieved it together so there's this incredible the, the the collaborative spirit just builds momentum on having a positive impact and there's i mean it's the same at my family foundation's board we set out to make a difference in juvenile justice and our board is so fired up to come together and think about what are we going to do next because it, it's exciting, right, to see that your investment is really making a difference for tens of thousands of young people. I mean, if New York, um, one of the policy things we're trying to do is get the age raised. Our juvenile justice system now ends on your 16th, uh, 15, the day before your 16th birthday. So sadly, in New York, at age 16 and above, you go directly into adult criminal court. And, and adult jails and prisons. So our governor came out in January to say we are gonna raise the age to 18 and we're gonna do it this year. And that would affect 50,000 kids every year, 16 and 17 year olds who are now currently being served in the adult system. So the, the potential to amplify the impact is just boundless, right? Uh, so just some key elements, and these are, you know, mu go into much more detail in the case study, so I'm happy I was able to bring a copy for everyone. Um, really making sure, someone mentioned this before, that the decision makers are at the table, that people who have the authority to change lines and budgets that don't have to defer to their bosses are at the table and um, making it a valuable experience for them. So bringing in high-level facilitation so that their meetings are productive, that people feel their voices are heard, and they feel like work is getting done. Um, the continuous communication is so important. People leave their jobs, new leaders come in, administrations change, politi pol new politicians come into office. This work cannot be dependent on any one individual or group to keep it going. And at the same time, one individual or group cannot bring down the whole uh, work. So you really need to be constantly educating the new people who come in, talking to them about the history of the work, finding out what they're excited about and making sure that they're engaged. Um, and also the lo you know, going from the state level to the local community and having that continuous feedback loop between those groups and doing it intentionally. The backbone organization, work has to get done between meetings. You can't just get people together on a quarterly basis to talk about collective impact and then go away to their jobs. You have to have people who are minding the shop and that are getting the work done, that are going out to those local teams, making sure the right people are at the table. The data has to be collected regularly. I mean, we have an online, live, searchable database now that people can go and see, how is the system working? Are things, is this program really effective? Um, so that takes staff, and staff requires an investment. So wherever that money comes from, it's, uh, it has to get done. And really recognizing that we can't just expect government to fix things. We can't just expect the private sector to fund every new and innovative program. We need to work together. We need to leverage our resources. And there's an opportunity for business, nonprofit, private philanthropy, and government to work together. Um, I had the privilege yesterday of meeting with a group of government leaders in juvenile justice. There is tremendous interest in collaborating with funders, with nonprofit groups to really make change happen. It's here, it's happening here in Australia, it's happening everywhere. It's very, very exciting. And I know you're all part of efforts like that. So um, the case study is in front of you, but we have a lot of other materials about how we got the work done in Connecticut. I know I have a session this evening 
6.30, if any, I, I think people can still sign up for that. If you really want to get in deep with what we've done and talk about it a little bit more, I'll be available for people then. Um, but feel free to uh, take a look at our website and download materials. And hopefully I still have time for some questions. <laughs> Not much, three minutes. <laughs>